name. And his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. When the Lord saw her, she was a widow, and a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her and said, Don't cry. Then he went up and touched the coffin, and those carrying it stood still. <clears throat> he said, Young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This is the word of God. seeing y'all this morning. Uh, I've been instructed by Pastor Jay I'm going to like stay in this zone, so I'm going to try my best. I'm a mover, right? So I don't move everywhere, um, but I got it. Thanks, PJ. Thank you. Um, today, uh, I'm going to be speaking on compassion, and uh, before we start, I just want to pray over this time, and then I'll probably read the verse again, and um, so let's just pray. And Father, Lord, we just thank you um, that, God, you are just amazing. That, God, you're the God who loves us but also disciplines us. You're the God who um, just works through our lives. And, and God, we just want to be uh, committed to you. We want to follow you, God, with our lives. And as we come as a church, God, would you just empower us by your Holy Spirit? We pray, Father God, as we dig deep into your words today, would you teach us about Jesus' compassion? Would you teach us about what it means to uh, live a life like you, Jesus? We want to follow you. We want to be like you, God. And so, God, would you just burn in us a fire, God, to, to live compassionately? I pray for my brothers and sisters today, uh, wherever they're at in their lives, God, would they be able to just rest in the peace of God this morning? Lord, we, we give you praise for all that you're doing, and, and we love you, Lord. We pray that you would guide these words today. We, we thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I'm going to read the text one more time. Thank you, Esther. It was awesome, right? Um, but I just want to read it one more time because I just want this story to sit on your mind. I want it to sit in, in all its entirety. And I want to just drop a little bit of background to the story before we read back into it. Jesus is just, um, and I'm moving, right? Jesus, Jesus has just uh, talked to his disciples. He's just given the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, right? Blessed are the meek. Blessed are all, all these things. And as, he, as he's speaking, he's speaking about also the poor, the marginalized in the society. And, and as, he's, as he's talking to his disciples, we get, a, we get a quick backdrop, a quick background of Jesus and his ministry. This is like the start of his ministry. This is where like people are coming to him, flocking to him. He's, he's met his disciples. He's just healed the centurion's servant. He, he, he's talked to this Gentile guy, and, and he's healed his servant. And, and Jesus is doing all these works. And then it comes to a point where he's in, in, in the apex of the ministry, where he's in this, this part of his ministry. And, and he comes to this little town called Nain. And I'm going to read into the story as we have that background and backdrop. Verse 11 says, Soon afterward, he went into a town called Nain. And his disciples and a great crowd went with him. He had people. He had an entourage. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, the man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother. And she was a widow. And a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came up and touched the bier, which is the coffin, and the bear stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and, glorified, uh, and they glorified God, saying, a prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. I think when we think about compassion in our day and age, some of us, we get pictures of, Maybe being nice. 
Some of us, maybe we get pictures of actually driving down the street, seeing the homeless person come up with a, with a you know, give me food, give me money. And we, we, we roll down our window and, and give them cash and say, yeah, you know, that's me give, being compassionate. Um, and yeah, and in some senses, there's an aspect of giving and love and compassion. But I really want to get and dissect this, 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 this view of Jesus and his compassion. I think a lot of times we get it twisted in, in, in understanding God's compassion because we measure compassion by our own measures. Compassion looks like this, this, and this. But true compassion comes from Jesus Christ. And we, we got to learn that. We got to see it. And we got to see it from his perspective. Um, my, my last sermon a month ago, I, I talked about um, the Ten Virgins and knowing and understanding God as part of a lifestyle and living for Christ. I also want to talk about being compassionate people for Christ, that this is an identity of who Christ is. And as we follow him, as we are imitators, and he desires us to be like him. As we look in this text, um, this is, this is a book for the Gentiles, right? Inclusion of the Gentiles. It also includes Israel. But it, it, it gets at, and, and, and as, as I set the stage with the Beatitudes, God, is, God uses those things as he's, he's working through his um, situation. And um, I'm just going to read the text real quick. Luke 11, uh, 13. And the first point I want to make today is I think... Um, Jesus shows us a lifestyle of compassion, right? But something as Christians we forget to see is this compassion in God, right? Um, and, and, and so my first point today is this. Jesus was willing to be interrupted. Man, i got to scroll up and down because I don't have my text up here, right? Um, 11 says this. Soon afterwards, he came to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd was with him. And as he drew near to the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out. The son, the only son of a mother, she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, do not weep. Jesus was on his way, and as I kind of like started and stated, Jesus was kind of on his way and doing his ministry thing. Like, it, if, if anything, he, he had his followers, he had his entourage, he had his people, and he was doing the, the will of God. He was, doing, he was talking about the kingdom of God. And, and, and for him to stop at a town like Nain, I don't know if we have the picture today. Um, do we have it? Uh, can you throw the picture up, Steve? Thank you. Oh, this is a beautiful picture when I was in Israel, right? We got to take a picture. There's like uh, power lines and stuff, so it's a little bit modern. But the, the town's not that big. The town is not that big. And, and Jesus, for his ministry, like it just doesn't strategically make sense to pass through this town. It doesn't strategically make sense for his life and his agenda and what he needed to do to go through this town. But he does. And as you see, uh, he stumbles across the situation as he's walking through the town. He sees a widow at the gate. And she is crying over her son who is dead. And, and I really want to bring this importance in verse 12, where verse 12 writes that this man was the only son of her mother, and she was a widow. Why is this important, church? Why in this text does Jesus, why do they have to talk about this? It's because in this culture, when you're a widow, right, not only is her son dead, which is like, Tragic For us, if anyone died in our family, we'd be like, oh my gosh, this sucks. Right? It would be hurtful. It would be like tough in our life. But not only that, but she was a widow. This is the one person, they lived in a patriarchal culture. This is the one person who she had to rely on. This was her life support. This was her name. All of y'all have last names, right? Think about that. The person that supports you, your name is gone. Your name is erased in history. This widow felt it. She felt the pain of losing her husband. She felt the pain of losing her son emotionally. She, she also lost her life source to take care of her. You know what widows do as widows during that period of time when they have to live in widowship? I don't even know if that's a word, right? But widow, they, what would happen is they have other two choices. One, they have to live as a prostitute 
in the Old Testament as a third tier wife, a wife of a person who um, they don't have any claim to that family, but they are just used for you know pleasure, but also for just helping the household. But they have no claims to the household. They're either that, or they have to, what's so ironic is she passes through the gate, and you know where people would beg? They would beg at the gate. And you know what they would do? They would poke their eyes out, right, to get money. And that was the life that she was embalmed in. That, that was the life that she had, looking as her son is dead. You can try to, un like, you can try to feel what she's going through. In this time, a lot of us, uh, a, a situation for us, it might be we, we have a job, we get fired, we like break our legs or something, we can't do anything, we're hopeless, we're helpless, we have no one to rely on. Could you imagine how that felt for the widow? Man. But we see Jesus' heart for the marginalized. We see Jesus' heart for the people who, who are helpless and hopeless. And in, in all of this, Jesus does what? Let me ask you a question. In all of this, what does Jesus do? What do we see about the compassion of Jesus? In all that he has, in all of his ministry situations, in all his agendas, in all of his busyness, in all that he does, we see in his character, he stops. In all of taking care of his disciples, he stops. In all of doing this, he stops for those who are marginalized, for those who are hopeless and helpless. And this is our God. He, I, I love this line. Um, Jesus is willing to be interrupted in our lives. A lot of us, guess what? You know what's funny? For us, compassion is, is, is based off of our timeline. If it doesn't fit our timeline, we're like, God, Sorry. If it doesn't fit in our monetary range, God, sorry. And I'm not saying it makes you any holy if you like give everything. I'm just, what I'm just getting at is this. I think a lot of times we have this thing in our hearts where are, are, we, willing to, are we willing to take time out of our lives for others in compassion? In, when I look at Jesus in my relationship with him, he didn't have to come down and die for me. He's the king of heaven and earth, right? He, he's, the, he's the God of heaven and earth. He's the God who's, who, who can do anything that he wants. But yet, he's a God who is so compassionate and so desires his people to know the truth, to know him, that in, in our relationship with him, that he comes down from his throne and stops everything that he does. Not for us, not that because we deserve it, because he's a holy God, because he's a righteous God, because he's a, he's a compassionate God. That's who he is. Jesus stops and meets her. He has so much ministry in his life, stops for her. The, what's cool about this text, I love verse 13. Verse 13, the word compassion, oh man, it's like the coolest word to pronounce, right? Splak ni zomai. Can you say that? Splak ni zomai. Right? Oh man, it sounds like, like splatter or something, right? But splagnizomai in Greek, it, it, it means having compassion, not just at some like up here level, not just from your mouth, not just from your head. It's from the bowels. You get cut to the bowels. He had compassion for this woman where she, he felt her pain. To be moved inwards, to feel the pain and sorrow in his inward being. That feeling that you get in those times of pain when you cry out with with all that you have and you're hurting, he was feeling that. I love, I love passages like this because I see, when I look at God, I see his intimacy. There's so much about God that like, I can't contain in a message. I understand that. But what I want to get at is his heart. Jesus' heart is so beautiful that he, he, he can understand where we're at. He, can, he feels and has compassion. He's not this distant God from us, but he desires us. Jesus is willing to set aside his time and have compassion for those who have nothing. And as, church, as the church, there's two things I want you to reflect on in that point. One is, do you understand the love of God for you? Do you understand, like, he has taken our wrath, and we deserve that, man. We deserve that wrath of God, but he loves us so much. 
that he's taken that. And in understanding his compassion for us, in understanding that he didn't have to do it for us, man, do we really understand that gospel truth of who God is? But in light of that, as Christians, what is God really calling us to do in our community? How do we have compassion for those where we just have too much, you know, like, uh, don't, don't mess with my time? I think when I look at my, you know, I'll give you an example. I went back to Maryland. I'm going to use a lot of Maryland examples today because it's fresh on my heart. But I went back to Maryland, and I was like, God, I was talking to God in the car. I was like, God, this is going to be awesome. I'm going to eat, I'm going to eat uh, crisp and juicy, which is like Peruvian chicken up there. I'm going to eat, like, all this food. And, like, you can tell I've been eating a lot, right? But one of the craziest things was as I was driving, the Lord just kept on opening opportunities at my house. And he was like, you know what? Sometimes you, don't, you, you are a Christian, but sometimes the closest people in your life, you don't have love for it. You don't love your mom enough. You don't love your dad enough. I've given them to you, but you don't have a life where you're compassionate about their needs. You take, 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 take. But you don't love in the love of Christ. Do they see Christ in your life in those little things? I was like, dang, God. I got issues. But it's so, it's so ironic. Sometimes we want to like change the world, but we can't even change our own houses. We, we, we need Jesus to change our houses. We need Jesus to change the small things first. Do we have compassion for one another in our church? Do we have compassion for those on the outside? Yeah. As Christians, in light of Christ's compassion, do we lack compassion in a manner where we feel as though time rules over us? Some of us, man, we get owned by work. Some of us, work owns and dictates how we feel about people. I tell you, man, there's times where I go back and I come back from school and then someone calls me and like, hey, I need to talk to you. One time, man, last like couple, three weeks back, a lot of my friends had all these problems about relationships. And I'm like, man, I don't got time for this. I got I to gotta, I gotta work, man. I got to do stuff. I'm like two, be two weeks behind my school. They're like, yo, you know, the problem. I love them. I love them. So I, I spent the time with them. I spent time with them, right? But what killed me was like, man, God, like. I'm so consumed, and sometimes I don't care about people because I'm so fixated on what I got to do. Jesus' compassion is like, man, he's headed first. He says, man, all right, I can separate this time. And we need, we need, we're not Jesus, so we need discernment on that too. I'm not saying like, okay, don't do it with discernment, but have discernment, but be willing to set aside time for others. My second point that I want to get at is this. Verse 7, uh, 14 and 15, Jesus was willing to set aside social convention for what was needed to be done. Um, can I get the verse, Steve? Can I actually just hold the verse up there? I love, yeah. Um, yeah, 14 and 15, my friend. You're doing a great job. Uh, then he came up and touched the beer, and the bear stood still, and he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. I love this text, because you know what Jesus is all about? Like, sometimes we're caught up in our social convention. He's a rabbi, first of all. Let me give you a hint. He's a rabbi. Rabbis, do you think they touch dead people? Do you think they even touch anything dead? No. Numbers 1916 says this, de declares, however, that anyone touches a human bone or a grave will be considered ritually unclean. What? Right? But this man's like, I'm going to touch it. Right? Uh, they move grave sites outside of the town. This is a, another thing about their, their, their uh, building structures. They move the graves outside of town because it's unclean. They don't want to even be near it. So this Jewish rabbi comes up and touches this Thing. This casket. And speaks, of, speaks those words and brings the, the son to life. One of the things that I see in this text that I'm just, as I look, Jesus breaks the Jewish cultural thing. He sees those who are hurt and he says, I want to show them God. I want to love them. I want to heal them. I want to restore them. I want to, and that's the awesome thing about our gospel in Jesus. He does that with our lives, doesn't it? It's so cool, right? But guess what? There's, as he does it to us, what happens? We do it to others. As we are touched by the love of God. As, see, that's why I don't get it. Sometimes when we do, like, like when I look at evangelism, like, other places, 
Like they just do it as like this program thing. I'm like, how is that possible? It has to come out of our relationship with Jesus. It's got to come out of what Jesus has done. That he crosses lines for us. That he does. When I see Jesus, I'm like, oh my God, this is what you do for people? And I, I, I can't even do this for others? It's like crazy. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm like running off on that tangent, but it just amazes me the gospel truth of God's compassion for us. That he's willing to cross whatever people think about him. He doesn't care what people think about him. He doesn't care what the Jewish Pharisees or Sadducees say about him. He doesn't care about his reputation. A lot of Jewish people probably been like, oh snap, he touched the coffin. Unclean, tis, tis, tis. But a lot of times in the scriptures, he does like, he touches the leper, he touches unclean people, and he just like heals them, restores them. And I love that about God. He crosses boundaries. He crosses, crosses social structures. He crosses things. And church, I think that's something that we have to look at in our own hearts too. Uh, I think the easiest thing, sometimes it's like, uh, you know, when I grew up in the church, I'm, I'm kind of a little bit weird. I'm like the weird type of Christian, right? Like I grew up like all like crazy and like whatever. And so like, you know, I think when like sometimes God calls us into places that are like really awkward or really weird. Uh, I know people that minister at bars. I'm not saying, you know, go to the bar, right? But I'm saying, you know, I see God's, people's hearts ministering to people that don't know Jesus at the bar. We gotta be, we, I think Christians, we gotta be less scared of what people think about us and more worried about what the king thinks about us. We gotta be less scared of how society thinks about us and we gotta be more, more worried about what our God thinks about us. And I, and I really believe that God, man, he breaks those social boundaries. He breaks those cultural boundaries. I even, let's, let's, you know, even like, for instance, gay marriage. I believe in what Jesus is talking about. And I believe as Christians, we have to stand up for our faith and who Jesus is. I believe it's wrong. But I'm going to love and I'm going to care. And, 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 but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold on to what is right. And when people... Like, when people hate on you, are we willing to even go through that for the king? But to have compassion as well. Um, I want to I wanna give you an example, man. I, I had a friend up in Maryland. He was a drinking buddy of mine, right? <laughs> we need to erase that, right? But um, <laughs> he was, he, man, he, man, come on, let's be on the real. Like, you know, there's things in college that you do, and that's before, you know, like, I was working some stuff in my life. But, you know, there's some things where, you know, we, we grew up with all this stuff that we did, you know, beer pong and whatever and whatever. And I'm, I'm not condoning that, but I want to bring this illustration up because I came back to him in Maryland and we were talking in Baltimore. And I love this brother so much because of who he is as a person. He's just a good person. He's like a nice person. He's always been like an like a older brother to me, looked out for me when I was like insecure about myself. Right? We're all insecure, right? Um, but what was crazy was we had this talk about Jesus. But I wasn't like, hey, let me tell you about Jesus, right? And, and I think that's necessary, but I think for me, when I was talking to him, I was just sharing him with my life. I was like, bro, he's like, how's life? And I'm like, man, life is good. I love God, right? I love what God is doing in my life. And it offended him. And he was like, all right. Like, you, you know when they're offended, because they're like silent, and then their face is like, mm. you're like, I don't want to talk about it, right? But... And I just kept on talking about it. I was like, no, but God is doing this in my life. And I see this. People get healed. And he's like, look at me like I'm crazy. right? And, and what's crazy is that as I'm talking to him, I can see the anger in his heart. I can see the boundary line. Do not cross this, sucker. Right? Do not cross this because you're gonna, you don't want to cross it. right? But sometimes God's like, no, I want to talk to them. I want to speak to them. I want to love on them. I want to care about them. I want to misconstrue some of their thoughts that they think about the church. Uh, like sometimes I think we're so passive about sticking up for the church too. Right? Giving them the right perspective of what Christians look like. Right? Um, but anyways, that's a side note. But as I'm talking to him, what was crazy was he started opening up. And he, he was, at first he was, he was really like, no, don't talk to me about this. Don't put your faith on me. And I was like, man, I'm your friend. I love you, but this is part of who I am. This is, this is part of 
part of who I am and I need to share with you. If we're really friends, we can share these things and dialogue and discuss. I'm not saying you have to believe in my God. I'm not saying you have to do those things. But what I'm saying is this. I just want to share life with you. I want to be in your life. I love you. Right? I, I, I pulled in some of the truth aspects. I was honest with him. Like Sometimes I think you're hurt with this or hurt with that. And we were discussing. And sometimes he brought up perspective. He's like, sometimes... Sometimes you got to be careful of this. Okay. But I think one of the things that I see is sometimes we're so scared to go through those boundary lines because we're gonna, we feel like we're going to hurt people. And guess what? We are going to hurt people. But I think we need to be sensitive and loving. And I think we need to be, have a compassionate heart where we sit with that person. But we're willing to go deep. Because you see, when Jesus crosses boundaries, he heals people. When Jesus crosses boundaries, when Jesus crosses those limitations, man, things start happening. I want to encourage you, church, to not just settle, not be scared to talk about Jesus in your life. Not because we have to evangelize, but because, well, this is part of who you are in Jesus. My last point, man, three points, okay? My last point. Jesus is willing to help in a situation that is already beyond help and hopelessness. Luke 7, 15 through 16. Steve? 15 through 60, my man. Um, it says, And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus came into his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen to us, and God has visited his people. At the, you see, through this progression of what <clears throat> Jesus was doing in this man, through this progression, you, you, you see the hopelessness. You see the death. You see the feeling of the widow. Man, you're like, man, this, this, this woman is done. She is dead. But you know what's crazy about this text? You know how many people Jesus raises back to life in this text? You guys want to guess? <laughs> That's why I stopped, right? How many people does Jesus raise back to life in this? <laughs> two two one the physical one the emotional social spiritual that's Jesus he heals he's holistically heals everything but verse 15 through 16 shows that when the sun wakes up a situation of light for the widow it's hope again she has a name again she is Oh, man, we think it's about the son, but it's about the widow. She has life. Even in the hopeless situation and the helplessness, could you imagine the joy that she finds in Jesus? Oh, my goodness. And these people see what Jesus has done. They, they don't just see the physical ramifications. They see the holistic ramifications of what Jesus does. His compassion is so deep. And I think this is something that we have to learn as a church with compassion. I think we are, we are quick quitters on people. Oh, they hate us. I quit on them. They don't, they, they don't need the gospel. No, we need to get out there, man. There were those people that irritate the crap out of us. And we need to speak truth into their lives, right? And sometimes we want to bring the hammer and the nail, right? I'm, gonna, I'm the hammer, you're the nail. I'm going to hammer, right? Sometimes we need that method with people. Sometimes we need the method of love and just saying, hey, I'm sitting with you. I'm walking with you. Uh, I, you know how I came to conversion? When a, who, someone who really impacted my life was my friend Pastor Byung as a mentor. I was, I don't know if this, I, I guess I won't use bad Korean words. Right? Um, like I was a punk, right? That's a word, okay? Right? I was a punk, right? But as a punk, I think one of the things was, like, I, I would, like, be so bad to him. I would be like, man, I don't believe in Jesus. Or, or like, I, I'm like, I'm, I believe in Jesus, but, like, eh, I don't want to do it. I don't feel like giving stuff up. I don't feel like... But this man just sat with me the whole time. His name is Pastor Bill, my man, right? And he said, Danny, I'm going to tell you the truth in your life. And it hurt like crap. I'm like, don't talk to me. I would not talk to him for three months. Don't judge my life. Don't tell me what to do. You don't know me. You don't know this. And he's like, I'm just telling you the truth. It comes from the Bible. If you really believe in the Bible, this is what it says. I'm like, but I'm like, still, I'm fighting him. I'm like, don't tell me the truth. I don't want to listen to it. And it came a point in time where he just walked with me in truth. Truth and love, baby. Truth and love, right? He walked with me. And he was there with me where I just broke apart. 
Right? I'm not saying, I'm not saying, but I, we all need Jesus. We all long for something, and I needed something. And, and when he talked to me, and when he was just compassionate with me in my life, it was something so awesome. I think, church, we need to take the example of Jesus in this text, where he doesn't see hopeless situations or helpless situations in people. We do that to people sometimes. You are a hopeless case. See ya. We need to start believing Jesus can do something in people. Because if he can raise the dead, what more can he do? If he can raise you from the dead, what more can he do for others? Church, let us live a Christ-like compassion. Jesus is not a big equation, right? We don't have equations for hopeless cases. But with Jesus, Jesus can do anything in anyone's life. I really believe if Adolf Hitler was here, Jesus could change his heart too. Because he's awesome. But are we willing to take that step as the people of God? To encounter, to approach with the love of God as he loves us first. I just want to end with this. Do not be disheartened, church. <laughs> I think a lot of times you get pumped up about messages and then you're like, all right, let's change people's lives. Right? And it doesn't work like that sometimes. Sometimes it's, it's a constant relationship with people. Relationships suck sometimes, but it's the most beautiful thing, right? It sucks because it actually takes effort if you want to have relationship with people. If you want to show people the beauty of Christ, it actually takes effort, right? Don't think you could drop a line and then say, peace, there's your God for you, right? No, it takes a relationship and an effort. But don't be disheartened because we have Christ. We have Christ who teaches us. We have Christ who leads us. We have Christ who gives us the compassion for people. There's times where I'm like, I do not have compassion for this person. I hate them. <clears throat> but when I ask the Lord, when I ask the Lord, he starts working on my heart. Application. Ask the Lord. There, there's people on your heart that you might revile or hate. Ask for God's compassion in that area. There might be times where, there might be areas of your life where you might be on a time frame and you're not listening to what God wants to do and have compassion for people around you. Listen, where is God leading you in that? And secondly, are you so stuck to what people think about you? Are you so stuck to uh, how society sees you or how church sees you that you're, like, I think it's good to see how church sees you, but I, I think, like, like, in, 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 how should I explain this? I think when Jesus walked out, the Pharisees accused him for being stupid, right? But are we stuck to religiousness, but are we stuck to loving God and being in his kingdom? Are we caring about that or caring about what people think about us? I'm going to leave you with that. Let's, uh, let's just pray right now.